Okay, in this video what we're going to look at is a concept called the moment of inertia. And we're also going to be using a parallel axis theorem in order to find some moments of inertia. To begin with, I think we need to define what a moment of inertia actually is. You may be familiar with inertia from Newton's first law. You know, uh, object in motion tends to stay in motion, object in rest tends to stay at rest also known as the uh, inertial law. And what it, what it really is is like a resistance to change. And so if you had it in physics, you probably talked about um, rotational inertia or the resistance to rotation rotational change. Uh, conservation of angular momentum plays into this as well, if you remember any of this stuff. Uh, and, and a classic example would be like this guy holding on to the weights and, and spinning on a chair and he sucks in the weights and he spins real fast or figure skater. That's not what we're going to be talking about when we talk about moment of inertia in this section. That's the mass moment of inertia. Instead what we're going to be looking at is the area moment of inertia. And the difference between those mass, for those who go on to dynamics, you'll be dealing with mass moments of inertia because it's uh, rotational acceleration. It's related to rotational acceleration. Versus the area, what we're talking about is resistance to to bending. So uh, strength of material statics classes, uh, or sorry, strength of material strengths structures classes, uh, or I-beams, uh, it's basically the function of an I-beam has a high moment of inertia, meaning it does it resists bending or movement. So that's the reason we care about it. Now let's talk about finding moments of inertia. Well, there's actually the, uh, there's already, you know, a developed moment of inertia for common shapes. And this table can be found in uh, under textbook images um, and or in the textbook itself. But you can see there's these shapes, a rectangle, triangle, circle, semicircle, quarter circle, ellipse. And uh, when we talk about these moments of inertia, you see this, uh, this I bar X prime. Uh, what that means is the moment of inertia about the centroidal axis. Uh, we have an X bar and a Y bar. So the moment of inertia about this axis. So if I had an axis going right through there and so I wanted to know the moment of inertia about that axis, it would be 1 12th BH cubed. Uh, and then if I wanted it about this bottom axis, this X, it would be 1 3rd BH cubed. So uh, and you can see the rest. There is this other thing, this J value, which you may not have seen before. And I'm not going to go into too much detail. This is called the, the polar moment of inertia. And you do need the polar moment of inertia. What that is, is I instead of resistance to bending, it's a resistance to twisting. So uh, when you go into strength of materials, you use the polar moment of inertia took like drive shafts and, and other things that are under a torque to see how much they resist uh, twisting. But it's not a it's not a massively hard concept. In fact, you end up just using the circular one, uh, this one half pi r to the fourth. Uh, but regardless, in, in here we don't aren't going to be concerned with the polar moment of inertia. We're only going to be concerned with your i values, not the j values. So another concept we need to cover today is this idea of radius of gyration. And I don't want to get into all the details. Uh, it's it's just a, another property of a cross section, you know, like area mass or density or the moment of inertia or this other thing called a radius of gyration in essence you know what it means it's very it's 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 not exactly the most intuitive thing it's like if i had this whole object and i wanted to replace it with a single strip of material infinitely thin how far away from the axis uh this is like my my x direction would it need to be so that it would have the same area and moment of inertia um, and I don't and I don't expect you to really to know all that stuff the only thing you need to know is the equation so the radius of gyration is k is the, the letter k is what we represent for the radius of gyration and k about the x axis is just the integral uh, sorry square root of the moment of inertia about the x axis divided by area and the radius of gyration about the y-axis is equal to the square root of the moment of inertia about the y-axis over the area. So those are the two equations, and, and there's not anything to know about it other than I figured we'd throw it in there since we're talking about moments of inertia if you hear this term, radius of gyration. Um, 
I can tell you we use it for uh, designing columns to see uh, how much load a column can have before buckling. Uh, you'll use this concept of a radius situation. But regardless, let's move on and talk about uh, how to use those that table in finding the, oh dear, there we go, in finding a uh, moment of inertia. Okay, for this example, we're looking at a triangle and this triangle has a base of three meters, a height of two meters. Um, we're looking for the moment of inertia about the X prime axis. That's the centroidal axis. If I had to talk about where the centroid is for this triangle um, and the X axis, which is the base on the bottom. It's a little obscured down here. Maybe if I draw the thicker line, not sure if that came through or not. Hopefully it did. Um, so with that in mind, um, what I can do, and by the way, the centroid of a triangle, if you looked it up in the other table we have, is one third of its height. And so one third of its height of two is where I'm getting that two thirds meter to get to that centroidal axis. So if I wanted to find out where the the x prime, uh, or the moment of inertia, what the moment of inertia is about that x prime axis, I head up to my table and I see that x prime is 136 bh cubed about, and it's telling me where that centroidal axis is, isn't it, h over 3. Um, 136 bh cubed, and while I'm here, the other one I want is about its base, which is 1 12th bh cubed. So looking at both of those, uh, for this x prime axis, I get a moment of inertia of 136, the base is 3, the height is 2, giving me something like uh, 24 over 36, which is the same thing as 2 thirds meters. Now the units would be to the fourth power because I have a length here and a length here cubed, so together that gives me a length to the fourth. Uh, and of course, if I wanted to put it in decimal play, decimal forms, is like 0.667 meters to the fourth or something like that, right? Um, and for the x-axis, same idea, except the equation is 1 12th b, which is 3 meters, times the height 2 meters cubed, which gives me uh, 24 twelfths or 2 meters to the fourth. So that's how easy it is using those tables, piece of cake, right? Um, but what if I wanted to find the moment of inertia and it wasn't at the very bottom? Like say I wanted to find the moment of inertia about that axis, way down here somewhere or up here or somewhere else. In order to do that, we're gonna talk about something called the parallel axis theorem. And basically what the parallel axis theorem allows us to do is if, if we can find the moment of inertia about the centroidal axis, like we just did a second ago, right, with this um, x bar, or x prime value, then I can come up with an equation that allows me to figure out what it would be a certain distance away. Or let's go ahead and just write out what the parallel axis theorem is. All right, so basically there's a definition sketched out. It's a method to find the moment of inertia about any axis parallel to the centroidal axis. And the equation looks a little something like this. The moment of inertia, in this case we'll talk about the x and some x value, has to be equal to the moment of inertia of the centroidal x axis, about the centroidal x axis, plus a d squared, where a is the cross-sectional area, and d is that distance away from the centroidal axis for that parallel line. So let me write that out for you. All right, so once again, ix prime, moment of inertia about the centroidal axis. I just looked that up in the table. a, the area of my shape of the cross-section. d is the distance I want to move my axis. Now, now, uh, up here I said there was this d value, say I wanted it all the way down there. Well, I can actually verify that this parallel axis theorem works if I look at this being my d. And in essence, I'm proving that table works for what the moment of inertia is about the base of that triangle. So the moment of inertia about the base is equal to the moment of inertia about its centroidal axis plus the a d squared. So let's see if we get the same result. Uh, well, the moment of inertia about the 
uh, x prime we found to be this two thirds of a meter. And then we're going to add in the area of a triangle is one half the base times the height, so that's the area. And we're going to multiply the area times the, the d value. Well, what is that distance? That's that two thirds. So I'm going to put in two thirds for that distance. I'm going to square that and I'm going to multiply that. I end up with two thirds plus 24 eighteenths. Finding con common denominators and all that, I end up with 36 eighteenths, which is the same thing as two meters. So I end up, sure enough, with the same result that I got when I used the table uh, than if I used parallel axis theorem. So let's talk about a general process of using parallel axis theorem to find these moments of inertia for basically composite sections or built up sections, meaning there's multiple shapes. So this is all based on the principle that these moments of inertia, if I have a composite uh, shape area, meaning I have multiple shapes, they can be added together uh, linearly. So here's the process we're going to use. First step is to find the moment of inertia for each shape. Then the second step was we're going to use this parallel axis theorem. So we're going to use parallel axis theorem to get the moment of inertia about a common axis. And usually this is the centroidal axis or the centroid of the shape. We want to know the moment of inertia about that. And that's really important for like figuring out how much a beam is going to bend or something like that. So after I have uh, used parallel axis theorem to get that moment of inertia about the same shape, the last step is to add up, or do the same process and add them up for each one of our shapes. Now I should say an option is that you can also subtract in the same way you can add if you need to remove an area. All right, at the risk of this being a really long video, I'm going to try and squeeze in a quick example. And after that example, I think you'll be good to go. I might do a separate video for yet another example. I'll call this example two because up, up there we had a different example. And this example two looks like this. So for this example, we have a T shape and we're trying to find the moment of inertia about the centroidal axis. So you can imagine that there's an axis that's right about there and that would be my centroidal axis and we've we've talked before about how to find the centroid I cannot draw a straight line to save my life close enough and uh, so that would be the first step is we have to figure out where this shape actually is which we were calling y bar which is our distance from the x-axis up to that uh, centroidal axis and we had an equation for that. This would be our first step here, I suppose. And our equation for that looked like this. It's equal to the sum of our y bar times the area over the sum of our areas. And I know before we did tables and we added tables when we did this, but I think we can just do this without, just, just flat out just say, I have two shapes here, right? I'm going to call this shape one and shape two. Uh, so I have two rectangles, and I think I can do this without doing the tables. So y bar for each shape, remember y bar is the distance from its centroid all the way down to this common place. So in this case, it's all the way down to the base. So for shape one, that centroid would be four to get up to the base of its rectangle plus another one, which gives me five, right? So I have my y bar is five. My area of that shape is base times height, which would be 6 times 2. The, uh, for my other shape, its centroid would be right at its midpoint down, so it would be 2 from the bottom up. And the area of that uh, is what? 2 times 4. It's a little weird. It says 1, but it's really 2 1, so it gives me 2 for that base. And I'm going to divide that by the areas, which would be 6 times 2 for the top shape, plus 2 times 4 for that bottom shape. And that gives me a value of like 3.8 inches. So the second step is let's find our moment of inertia about that axis. And our equation looked like this. Our moment of inertia is equal to the moment of inertia of each shape plus a d squared. Well, I have two rectangles, and this is about an x-axis, right? So if I go up to my table, 
what we're really talking about is the moment of inertia about this x prime which is right here this 1 12 bh cubed so that's our fundamental equation for each one of these shapes so if I look at the top shape, what that does is it finds the moment of inertia about that axis right there. Okay, so let's look at shape one. And that moment of inertia for its x, right, it would be 1 12th, the base is 6, the height is 2. That gives me a value of like 4. And then I have uh, to use this parallel axis theorem. So I know that the actual moment of inertia for what I'm looking for, I should say prime probably right there, right? This is prime. So my moment of inertia that I actually am looking for would be the moment of inertia plus the area, which is 6 times 2, times d squared. That d is probably the hardest part. What is this little distance there? That is my d. Well, I know to get from the bottom all the way up there was what, five, and I know it's 3.8 to get to uh, the centroidal, so five minus 3.8 is that D. And we're gonna square that term. That gives me like 21.28. These are inches and the units would be to the fourth power. Now we're gonna do the same thing for shape two. And the moment of inertia of the centroidal is, once again, 1 12th, the base is 2, the height is 4, gives me like 10.667. And so the moment of inertia would be equal to that 10.667 plus the area, which is, uh, what, 2 times 4 times D. So what is D for this one? Well, now we're saying the centroidal axis little distance here is 2. So it would be that 3.8 minus 2. Square that, and I get a total moment of inertia for that shape of 36.589. So that means that my total moment of inertia is equal to the moment of inertia of the first one plus the second one. I didn't really number these. You could call this I1 and I2. It's a little funky, I guess. I don't know. Normally when we do this, we just do it all in one step, right? So that's why this might look like I'm last minute trying to label. And if you look at the notes, I did do it all in one step. I'm just trying to map it all out for you. So if I add both those together, I ended up with like 57.87 units would be inches, inches to the fourth or inches to the fourth. So I hope you found that helpful. I'll see if I can maybe find another decent video to post, uh, but give the homework a shot. Uh, most problems end up being like this. If anything, there's one less step where you don't have to find the, the centroidal axis. It'll tell you something else. But good luck. Let me know if you have any questions or comments, and I'll talk to you all later. Thanks.